camp. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you see a more moving <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Take two. <laughs> It is uh, 101, and I'm calling the November 20th, 2023 meeting of the Albemarle County Architecture Review Board to order. Uh, could we call the roll, please? Mr. Stoner? Here. Mr. Mitsuno? Here. Mr. Vanderwerf? Here. Mr. Henningsen? Here. And Mr. Hancock is absent. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, today's meeting is a hybrid meeting. The public may access and participate in the meeting electronically. Instructions for doing so are posted on the Albemarle County Calendar website at the Albemarle County Calendar. The public has real-time audiovisual access to this meeting over Zoom and real-time audio access over telephone. Both is provided in the lawfully posted meeting notice. This meeting is being recorded and will be made available on the county's website. This meeting is a public record and subject to disclosure under the Freedom of Information Act. All speakers, when it is your turn to speak, please first state your name for the record. Applicants who are making presentations, note that your presentation is limited to a total of 15 minutes, which you can divide among your team members. Staff will let us know when the 15 minutes are up. If applicants in the meeting room have team members attending virtually who will need to present, please make that known when you come to the podium. Everyone who is participating virtually, please mute your microphone until it is your turn to speak. Uh, do any ARB members have anything to disclose? No. 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 Uh, I do have a uh, scheduling item um, in the event that we're still going at 2.40 p.m., I will have to leave and we'll uh, hand the reins over to Dade. Um, and hopefully that won't happen and we'll be done before then. Um, are there uh, any members of the public that want to make a comment about a project that is not on the agenda for review? All right, great. Uh, we do not have any consent agenda items today, so we will move on to our regular review item. Uh, there is one, and it is ARB-2023-92, Dunlora Park Phase 2. Uh, Mariah, do you have your presentation? <clears throat> yes. Thanks. Um, good afternoon. My name is Mariah Gleason. I'm a senior planner, too, in the planning um, division of community development. Um, today, I'm going to pre be presenting ARB 2023-92, Dunlora Park Phase 2 Townhomes. This um, project is, a, or this is a first review of the architectural designs. The proposal requires ARB review due to its proximity to the route, the Rio Road East and John Warner Parkway entrance corridors, symbolized in the orange arrow. The subject property, shown in red, is comprised of three platted, and graded townhouse lots located at the southeast corner of the intersection of Dunlora Drive and Barrick Street, approximately 280 feet from Rio Road the East Entrance Corridor. The townhouses are part of a 34-unit residential development known as Dunlora Park. Residences within the development are typically two to three stories, um, single-family attached and detached units. Dunlora Park is surrounded by other residential developments to the north, east, south, and KTEC is located west of the site. The subject property is separated from Rio Road East and John Warner Parkway entrance corridors by two parcels that contain a multi-use path and are planted with various trees and grasses. That block, shown in white, contains a grassy berm at, at, at its southern end in a sunken central area towards the middle and northern end. These images were taken from the entrance corridors to understand the expected visibility of the site. What they show is, are that the townhouses, particularly the western elevation of lot 31, located closest to the entrance corridors, identified with a star, will be visible from the Rio Road East entrance corridor. Due, due to the topography of the planted block, only the upper stories and roof lines of the townhouses are expected to be visible from the parkway entrance corridor. The site plan for the three townhouses was approved under, under the Dunlora Park Phase II site plan, which was later amended by a major site plan amendment. 
the proposed architecture of lots 29 through 31 is generally compatible with the characteristics of existing units. These images illustrate the proposed architectural features, colors, and materials. The primary issue um, staff found in the report is the design of the west elevation of lot 31, which is expected to be the most noticeable and visible, or expected to be most noticeable and visible from the entrance corridor. This elevation uses <clears throat> Arctic white siding, which will draw attention to the unit, and the elevation is mostly blank. Other minor issues included needing additional labels on the material selections document, confirming window glass material and the location and screening of mechanical equipment. This is the full set of recommend recommendations and recommended points of discussion. Are there any questions about the report or presentation I can clarify for the board? All right, well, thanks a lot for the presentation. Um, I'll uh, just roll through and see if there are any questions. Uh, Tara, do you have any? No, no questions. Uh, Dade? No questions, thanks, Moran. Frank? No, none for me either. <clears throat> and I don't have any questions either. Uh, Thanks. Um, so the applicant is here and has a presentation. Um, now would be the time. Thank you. I'm Chris Schooley with Greenwood Homes. Uh, we don't have a presentation, but if you just have any questions, um, it seemed like reasonable recommendations for us. Sure, I'm never too quiet, so try to be louder. Um, I, it, you can only see the top half. Um, we usually we surround the mechanical equipment anyway with a fence, so that's not a big deal. Um, we would just ask with some flexibility that kind of moves a little bit on the side of the house, depending on where it fits the best of the house. I think other than that, uh, probably landscaping is the best solution for that side, and we don't mind moving the Arctic white to a different one of the three townhouses or not using it all together. Um, I think that was it. Was there anything else Ms. Cleason need to cover? Uh, the window glass. Yeah, what was, what was the issue with the window glass? Making sure it's not highly reflective or tinted. Okay, yeah. The, the only issue we had that we talked about was the that we block out the dormer windows, but that's on the front, so you couldn't see that anyway. Otherwise, it would be standard windows. All right. I guess we'll just see if any board members have any questions. Um, Frank, do you have any questions? I don't think I do, no. Okay. Uh, Dade? None for me, thanks. Tara? No, thanks for um, clarifying. Appreciate it. Okay, thank All you. Right. Thanks a lot. All right, are there any uh, members of the public that want to comment? All right, so the ARB will now go into discussion. Um, I guess, uh, Dade, do you have any comments? Uh, no further ones, appreciate Mariah's good report and the applicant's uh, willingness to incorporate the staff comments. So thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, Tara? Same here, thank you very much. Thanks, All right. Yeah, I, uh, the, only, the only question I'd have really relates to the compatibility of the architecture proposed in the new building with what's in the neighborhood. Because it's kind of a unified concept through there. So I don't know if probably should ask that of the applicant, but did you guys, that, that may be outside our purview as well. So um, because it's not visible. <clears throat> so this. This group of images was taken from a visit to the site and demonstrates the design character of the existing residential units within the development. Um, overall, there is strong consistency between the units. They use lap siding, um, muted earth colors, and um, gabled roofs, dormer windows, and porch accents. These townhouses are on noticeably the smaller lots and from due to the visibility of what you would see from the the distance from the entrance corridor, how much would really be visible. Um, we thought that the, it, the architecture proposed is in the same family um, and consistent that way, but they, they will look different. They are townhouses versus 
um, a, a larger lot size for single family attached, detached. Okay, thanks. All right, thanks. Go ahead. <clears throat> I guess uh, I kind of share Dade's opinion that the the staff comments seem reasonable, and um, since the applicant seemed to think they were reasonable too, uh, I don't really have anything to add. So um, I guess uh, we could take a look at the motion um, just to see if anybody has any adjustments. Well, let me ask before we even look at it, th does anyone have any adjustments that they would like to make or think they may have any adjustments? I don't have any to the staff comments. I, I don't know whether the motion allows for administrative staff approval. Um, uh, personally, I don't see a need to see the application again if staff is satisfied with how those are incorporated. I agree with that. I would agree. <clears throat> Said, but I think you said you were fine with the. Uh, yeah, it didn't sound like uh, anyone had any tweaks, um, and uh, I think generally we'd be okay with um, staff uh, approval after after this point. Um, so in that case, um, our recommended motion is for approval with the conditions listed in the staff report. Anybody uh, want to make a motion? I'll move that we approve uh, the proposal with conditions listed in the staff report with no amendments. I'll second. All right, thanks. Uh, Mr. Vanderwerf? Aye. Mr. Hank, Mr. Stoner? Aye. <clears throat> Mr. Metsuno? Aye. And Mr. Vanderwerf? Aye. Thank you. I think so. <laughs> sorry. And I'm sorry, who who was the second? I got two votes. <laughs> I, I was the second. All right, thanks a lot. All right, so we have uh, two work sessions today. Uh, the first is a discussion with Bob Pinio of Design Develop on the process for creating images submitted to ARB review. I'm gonna pull up that presentation. Um... some old friends out there. Good, so um, I think it was back in September, maybe August, uh, the board discussed, um, looked at some images, uh, sort of before and after images of the Presidio um, uh, project. And um, we've been working with the um, applicants to sort of figure out what's, what's, uh, what, um, what happened between Sorry about that while we get that fixed. Uh, so we had discuss, discussed the befores and afters and uh, working with the applicant to sort of um, bring some um, greater explanation of that for you. And so that's why um, Bob's here today and he's gonna um, give us some, uh, some extra background and detail on that. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, so uh, this is a, a uh, we went through the kind of some of the specifics which I'm more than happy to do. I wanted to give you a 
deeper view into some of the things that we're doing uh, as a workflow process, um, just so you understand the context of it. Um, and then we can get into the specifics about working with Margaret. We've been in front of the board a lot uh, over the years. And uh, just from a, I find that the 3D world uh, or the technology associated with three-dimensional uh, workflows are advancing at a pretty fast rate. We've always been trying to be at the cutting edge of that. Um, and so this is a quick, hopefully you won't find this too boring, but uh, a little bit about us, a little bit about the work that we've been doing for the last almost 20 years here that's associated with three-dimensional perspectival images uh, and how where we came to is specific, specifically with uh, Presidio but also as a bigger item, when you see when you see three-dimensional items before you, what is the standard? Where did they come from? Uh, how were they produced? Uh, what was the intention behind them? I think that's a bigger uh, review. Um, so kind of philosophically, where does this stuff come from? Where's the technology heading? There are new advances uh, in technology that make uh, my job even easier. So uh, our job at design develop and the design community. So basically, um, I hope this is not too boring, but I just wanna give you a background. Um, using technology to tell more compelling and accurate stories. That's, that's what we try to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we have two teams, one in Baltimore, one in Charlottesville. We're using, uh, there's little white figures behind because we've added three to our staff. But uh, we've been around th since uh, 2006, 2007. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, so this is uh, this is the partnership. Uh, we have uh, uh, 11 people, um, and that's me and the studio director for uh, Charlottesville, Kevin Schaefer, which is he's presenting in front of you all the time, and our uh, Baltimore uh, studio head, uh, Con Yuan. So technology and workflow. Um, I'm going to kind of break this down into three things: um, how the how the the world is changing relative to how we capture and design buildings three dimensionally, uh, how we capture and res and and uh, work with topography and tree canopies, and the next thing is uh, is three uh, D point cloud scan technology that we have incorporated into our business. Something happened there with this slide. Uh, so this is uh, the reason we love three-dimensional work. Uh, I'll get into that in a second, but it's really about synthesizing all of the constraints of any of our projects, being able to talk about those constraints, um, how, how they influence design, how, they, uh, how the client can participate in the resolution of those, and then presentation. So presentation, when we come to you, it's towards the latter part of that discussion. What do you want, client? How does it look? How does it fit in the context? So we're presenting images, not really just for you, but these are at the end of our design process and now um, architectural review, BAR review, things like that. So this is a quick story. This is my 2004 aha moment. I was designing a building for a couple. And after about an hour and a half of looking through the elevations and the sections uh client turns to me and points to the door and says what is that it's points to the door sig signal uh symbol go to the next slide and goes what is that and you can go one more and that's a door symbol but for people that they're a very smart couple they just didn't know the language of architecture so the language of site design the language of architecture everybody's got their own kind of uh slant on how they present things but a lot of times doesn't mean anything to somebody else because it's kind of your my language or or the site plan or a civil engineer, a mechanical engineer. They convey information, but a lot of times to somebody who doesn't understand them, it's more confusing than not. And it took this particular couple an hour to talk about, uh, you know, their confusion. My job is to give them what they want, and I'm talking a language they don't understand. So we're born into a three-dimensional perspectival world when it comes to talking about uh, what we want, or as a community, in this case, what's acceptable, talking in a language that everybody understands seems like a very natural uh, progression of, of thought and technology. So this, uh, my journey with this uh, came from the Boston area, came down here 
uh, quickly met um, Brian Wheeler from Charlottesville tomorrow. And he, I was kind of telling him about this, how the process of, um, you know, of debate on a community level with built structures uh, is kind of confusing. And he showed me, he goes, well, um, the Ragged Mountain Dam uh, project was happening at that point. And he showed me an eight and a half by 11 sheet of a section through the dam. And to me, it looked like, well, that's no big deal until I found out every half inch was 100 feet. So being able to scale that drawing or scale that so that the community could understand what was coming, uh, we started thinking about well, what's something that somebody knows that's in the community. They know that the, the rotunda, they know how big it is. Well, this is three rotundas with all of its side buildings right next to each other and there's still room for more. So it was, it was kind of this beginning of helping the community understand visually uh, the things that were coming and democratizing these uh, things so that they're perspectival, scaled, um, shade shadow, texture. Uh, you can go on to the next one. So we started doing a lot of things with, uh, with Charlottesville Tomorrow when Brian was there. Um, we started doing something, the restoring station, uh, which was a Joe Higgins project on 29, very controversial for whatever reason. Uh, well, we showed the plans in context at scale and you could see it from the entrance corridor. So the whole idea of visualizing where you were at specific points um, was an easy thing to do from a technological standpoint. We also work with him to, um, and you can click onto the Western Bypass. So at the time the Western Bypass was you know, happening and uh, nobody knew about it. Again, these kind of drawings that were very hard to stitch together and to understand so we modeled everything three-dimensionally with, um, with Google Maps, and I'll get into that in a second, but Google Maps uh, brings to scale drawings with photorealistic uh, 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 material with it, topography. So we overlaid the plan of um, the Western Bypass onto that, showed vignettes of it, tried to let everybody understand what the context, uh, you could blow little sections up where there was complexity. Um, so that was, uh, that was the, uh, the Western Bypass project. Go back to that presentation. I think see how, yeah, right there, that's good. So we did that, um, that was very well received and people printing it out and as a, on a public forum, people could now understand it a little bit better. Go down to the next slide. We also did uh, something for the uh, Southern Environmental uh, Law Center. This was called Let's Go 29, you can click on that. This was a video, it's kind of not photorealistic uh, and this is one portion of it, trying to describe how traffic flows might work and this uh, spooey which was gonna happen, which hasn't happened yet, but letting China give somebody graphic sensibility of, of what's happening and why. And uh, in this case, we were trying to tell a story, so this was narrated. You can't hear that, this was a while ago. Technology's changed a lot since then. We were stitching together a lot of uh, nascent uh, workflow. Uh, but again, telling stories, trying to be more accurate with them. Um, trying to be descriptive of what's happening. Okay, next slide. Uh, re most recently, we did the Ravana Station uh, for the, the county, and this was all about visualizing this uh, this tract of land that uh, I think if you, it should be a video that loads. But again, using the same kind of technology, 3D, uh, or sorry, the Google Maps, uh, the site plan that was given to us, a little bit of invention when it came to, um, I think if you accept all, it should be it should be an animation that runs, or maybe it's loading. Oh yeah, maybe in that bottom left hand corner. So this is all about storytelling and with accuracy. Uh, it's not down to the foot, but it's down to the to, you know uh, as far as the information that's readily available to us. So topography, the building form, uh, some existing parking, others that has been, you know, other building form and site plans that were really depictive, you know, kind of uh, rudimentary. 
Um, but we were able to model those things. And again, trying to tell a story of what could be coming. Um, so this was uh, successful in that the county had a vision that they could let everybody see, anybody who, who can see and, and see things visually, uh, three-dimensional, perspectival, and shade, shadow, but also scale. So what's this whole thing look like? What are certain parts of it look like? And as a community, we can debate whether we want them or not want them, but this is um, hopefully a true version, an accurate version of what was being uh, 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 debated. Next slide. Um, in our own work in front of, I've just got some examples of ARB uh, work, but we also do a lot of uh, work in the city. Um, Superu, we just finished that. Uh, Region 10 Women's Shelter, that was four or five years ago. Ropen, you can see on the bottom right-hand side, all the Ivy proper to go through a couple Presidio is, is on there. We'll probably go back to, uh, actually, why don't you go on that? And then we can come back and uh, if you don't mind, go to ARB images. So, and you can just kind of click through any one of those. This was, uh, that's the Monticello. So again, uh, seeing what Monticello, you know, what was the impact from Monticello standpoint. Um, but using, this is a good image to start with because this is where the images in question uh, came from, but I want to talk about process. So we modeled three-dimensionally the existing topography, the, the, the road, uh, specific, you know, the bridge, uh, uh, Route 64. And so we have a very, very accurate um, depiction of, at scale, of the entire site. And then after that, it depends on where you take a picture from. Uh, you know, so the camera can go to any one of these spots, which is part of the storytelling part of it. What do you want to know and where? Yeah, so we can, you know, the idea is to tell you a, a, a picture, uh, take a picture from the bridge above it, around it, facing south, facing north. Um, anything you want to do, you can explore that model, and it should be very, very accurate. So that's the work, you know, there's a lot of work that we've done uh, in front of the board. Yeah, I think a good one, Margaret, would be one that kind of shows like the 19 or 20. Yeah, that one. So this is, uh, this is proof of concept. And working with the client, we went through a lot of iterations. Uh, we weren't the base architect, but we did help the owner make improvements, you know, facade improvements. So we started with the model. We started with uh, things that could be, you know, improved upon. And then the site was modeled at scale with all the retaining walls, the right elevations, things like that. Um, and then it's a question of materiality, color, form. Um, and this is choice. These are things that, that we debated with ARB, but also the client chose. And we can show you basically at any at any vantage point what it might look like. Um, and the great news here is that for all of the, the, for the couple of images that are in question, we can talk about what happened there. But basically the entire site, all of this is, is built to a very, very high accuracy to what was, you know, what was built. And also depiction of the materials. Um, we can't, we don't build it obviously, but uh, these are all indications of what it would look like if the material palette used was, was, was uh, done. Okay, let's go back to the um, slideshow and go to the next slide. So I wanna talk a little bit about new technologies and workflows. I just got back from a conference at Trimble, which is a geospatial, uh, uh, organization in Las Vegas. It was amazing what they're doing and what's coming. Um, so we've, Google, uh, uh, Trimble has bought SketchUp. That happened about five or six years ago. So SketchUp was our primary kind of uh, narrative tool or, you know, three-dimensional tool. 
Um, so we got all our 3D topography from that. We could also model from that. We could take pictures from that. So that was our base. That's what a lot of the work you've seen before, like the, uh, like the, um, it's still, it's still a big part of what we do, but we've also switched, uh, moved to Revit. Go to the next slide. So uh, that's SketchUp was our base. And now the state has flown uh, using LIDAR the entirety of the whole state and has made that LIDAR avail uh, data available for download. And what's amazing about that LIDAR is that it's not only gives you incredibly accurate ground plane, it also gives you incredibly accurate um, canopy and building um, uh, information. So you can go to the next slide. And using something called um, segmentation, you can run a automated AI is kind of <laughs> moving into this world, into our into the architectural world as well. And using AI and or algorithms, what it does is it looks at the data that's captured. Does anybody, everybody know what LIDAR is? Yeah, so LIDAR is well, not that, it was invented in the 70s, um, but basically it's a, it's a light pulse that goes out and it hits until it hits something that stops it. It measures that point in an XYZ coordinate system. And it does that hundreds and hundreds and billions and millions of times. And what it does is it produces a three-dimensional duplicate of the existing conditions. So a digital duplicate at scale. So what you're looking at here is a, a portion of a LIDAR image or LIDAR data that was captured. And then using segmentation, you can distinguish between ground plane, vegetation, power lines, buildings, things like that. So it automatically pulls that information out. This is useful for us because it's not only available publicly and for free, we can now um, visualize our buildings and any context at a very, very high level of accuracy without a lot of work, without a lot of extra work. So this is an image of um, a winery that we're doing. And on the top image, you can see a picture, a photograph of the site. And then uh, this is a, a, our model. And in the background, you can see the, um, the LIDAR information that came off the state. So now there's this parity between, visually speaking, between what we think was there. And it's also capturing uh, tree canopy as well which has always been a bit of a challenge for us because um, we didn't have an accurate source except through kind of guessing what a tree, you know, trees grow and they move and they get cut down. It's part of the part of the issue that happened in, in Presidio. We had a very, very accurate topography and road elevation and building, um, but it was hard, it was more subjected to understand where what trees were being left and their impact mm -hmm. on the on the uh, so I think we've solved for that at, at, to this point. Uh, the other thing we're doing is a 3D point cloud scanning. Uh, what you see there is a scanner. It collects um, 125 million points in three minutes, and it digitizes those points, takes a high-resolution image, and unlike the image you saw before, which were kind of colors, this adds an RGB value. So if it captured this surface that would be black, that would be brown, uh, you know, so it's almost like a photorealistic version of the as-built conditions. So the amazing thing about that camera, you put it in here, you capture 125 million points, you go to that doorway and open it up, capture another 125 million points, it stitches those together, and then you go around the whole building and you get, you know, in a day or so, I'd probably do this building and not as a big building maybe two or three days, we get a digital duplicate of the building itself. Uh, so every measurement down to an eighth of an inch across the whole building is a du digital duplicate of it. This is just to say where we're going. I think you might, you might wanna click on to that link. This is a little video that we did. Um, and Margaret, if you go to about the midline, I wanna just show you. Uh, Try that. So here's a here's a good explanation of what we're trying to do here. So what we have, yeah, if you could pause it, that would be awesome. Uh, so what we have here is the 3D point cloud scan of the transit center in Charlottesville. And we just use this as an example. 
very, very hard to get as built conditions on a building like that because it's in a public way, it's tall, it's not orthogonal, it's pitching back. So our scanner catches all that information. Then we bring it into what you're looking at as SketchUp and we can model to it. So we understand, you know, you're, you're drawing a vector line drawing to the existing conditions and then you're getting a very, very accurate representation because you're using that the old days, the way we used to do it five years ago, we still do it, some people. You take a tape measure, you measure this building. This is curved, a little curved. So the question is, how do you get good, accurate as-built? Uh, it's, it's actually quite difficult the old way. And I feel like we've jumped from like a, not caveman, but you know where we were to astrophysicists in one fell swoop. Not that we invented the technology, but we're, uh, we're using it to our highest advantage. So the, the good news there, we can go down to the next uh, slide, is that using the point cloud and for the work of the ARB, uh, this is another example of honing in to what is, what's the story you wanna tell and how accurate it is. And there's always been, and there probably always will be a subjective reality to the story that you're telling. Where's the image? Where, where did you take the picture? Uh, why did you take the picture where you took it? What are you trying to show? What are you not trying to show? Um, this, and I won't say that we're trying to show our best light, you know, for our projects. And we're also trying to show um, uh, areas of impact. Like if there's an intersection that the ARB cares about, then obviously we, but we basically put the camera in that location and take a picture, you know? So there isn't a lot of gamesmanship being played here. We're not trying to, uh, you know, to show you something that's not there. Um, and so this is a picture of just how buildings are represented, a point cloud, just like this building, you could scan it. It would look like the thing on the left because it's all, all the point clouds build uh, a comprehensive idea of the building. And then we model to it. And then we take that building and put it into, uh, you know, into, a, into the site model. So anything that you saw, you could have an incredible amount of, of um, uh, strength or you know understanding that it was it was as real as we could get. Next thing, and then how the point cloud works into making three dimension, you know, into making construction models and images. So what you're seeing here is that ortho orthogonal view, elevational view. So this is blending that whole world of the plan section elevation uh, back to what's necessary to build, let's say, or I know some people just want straight elevations. They want, that's how they've compared other projects. So this doesn't preclude that. It allows for all of that investigation. And it's also, again, in the case of the architecture profession, we're trying to make good, accurate stories that democratize the uh, design process so that the owners can you know, be part of that, of, of that, um, of the experience for the thing that they want. And then we're showing you to our best of our abilities, the reality of what it will look like. So that's kind of the end of my, um, presentation. Um, the problem with the, with the Presidio was, uh, basically came down to one element, which was the existing trees. And we had a sharp embankment. Uh, the viewpoint, if you look at the images that we have, and then if you even go to Google Earth and you look at the maps and the, the you know how you can uh, street view. So the buildings are perfectly situated elevationally. They're exactly right. Problem was that there was a slope that came up and the level of disturbance, it was the trees, since we didn't have the LIDAR, it was more of a guessing game of how far the, the disturbance was and how far the trees were, because it's hard to designate how high they were. Um, uh, so the trees were taken off of the slope further than we thought, and they weren't as tall as we thought, and that was what created the, the problem. So elevationally, the, so there was a, there's a slope there. You can imagine a slope that's populated with trees we had an image of, of, a, of a street map. So that's the image that we use to, um, to identify the perspective. 
what we didn't know was how far the trees were they were going to get cut down and their relative height. So if they were higher, closer to the bottom of the heel of the build of the site, they would have done a better job of protecting it. As it was, a lot of the tall trees were on the upslope, uh, which we couldn't tell from from and admittedly, it's one of the, it's, it's because it's it's not subjective. We'd have to go out there and measure trees to understand their impact. Uh, uh, that's where the majority of the, of the problem of this image came from. But again, the visual parity between elevationally the bridge and where the, uh, where the site was and the site walls and the buildings and all that was tied to the two elevations of, you know, not only the highway, but also um, the Sentara driveways, you know, uh, the Sentara um, circular path, those things were all tied in together. Thank you for your presentation, Bob. And thank you also for all the presentations you've made before the board. I, I know all of us really appreciate the clarity and the thoroughness that you uh, bring to the work and, and uh, how you help us understand the projects before us. Appreciate as well the, the background on uh, this view and what data there was and, and wasn't. Um, I guess, um, well, I don't know, uh, Chris, or to you, are we just, uh, we're in a work session and discussion? So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, I guess, do you have uh, thoughts or recommendations on what we might do as a board uh, to avoid, um, you know, a repeat where um, um, an outcome is, is different than we expected it to be? Um, I think it's a good question. I think it's a question of process. And the question I would ask, I feel like we've been, in, if we were doing this like haphazardly, we'd be in front of you a lot. Uh, just from all the things that we've done, and if you go and compare, they're you know they're close facsimile to each other. So I think the a bigger question or a question to ask, which is the root of what you're asking, where are these coming from? How do I know as somebody who's reviewing them? Uh, there's always subjective standings, even a site plan. Can you make sure that you're speaking. Oh yeah. Even like sorry, sorry. So there's always a sub subjective reality um, to perception, you know, so a site plan, things get missed. I think that's why people like what we do because there's less subjectivity to them. Um, I might ask the question, uh, what was your process when you delivered these pro these images? And especially because it's so new, it's kind of the wild, wild west, you know, like there aren't a lot of rules. Uh, what was your process? What was your intent? Uh, can you describe where these things came from, um, you know, as a board? Um, and just knowing how things are derived, is this a, a, a image that you drew over? You know, what was the level of technology that you used to come to this conclusion? Um, I would say that's a, a, a good place to, uh, to start, at least in questioning um, intent. Bob, it looks like in, in the original rendering that you guys did, that the wall structure at this particular project was different than what ended up getting built. Is that true, or does this accurately reflect what you guys showed on your... <clears throat> All I can say, you're talking about the retaining walls? Yeah. All I can say is we don't go back and verify. We model what was given to us uh, from a site plan perspective, so we take out top of walls, the elevations that are that are driven. You might go back to um, go back to the presentation, back to that presidio, because uh, there's an overall view image. Um, so yeah, go down a little. Yeah, you're right. Go there. Go to that Dropbox image. Yeah, we could actually pull them up side by side, maybe on the left and the right sides of the screen. And do do that one right there, that page 32. So relative to the retaining walls, that's that's what's built. And if you look at the, what we had rendered, again, I don't go back and verify, but what I what I what we do do is use the site plan, 
and take the top of wall uh, and model it as accurate as, as as we can to depict it. And Bob, some of the 3D views included um, trees at the steps in the retaining wall. Were, were those present in any of the perspective views or they were just in the aerial? Uh, we're going back a couple years now. Um, I typically would render whatever's there. So if there's site plan, because you can see in our images, the site plan came with um, uh, landscaping, you know, uh, images, um, or, or, you know, uh, specifics, what the planting, where they were, we would model those and, and put them in as they were there. I, I think earlier in the review process, there might have been landscaping shown on the site. Um, but then when we got some of the other images that showed it, that the lower areas didn't look like they were gonna be visible from uh, the interstate, we just stopped looking at the landscaping in those areas around the, the retaining walls because we didn't think the walls were gonna be visible. I would it say- It looks like the walls got a lot closer together because there is no landscaping between, like here it's showing trees at every level it looks like. I would have to show you what I modeled and when. Um, the objective is to model it very accurately with the, the latest information that we have. So that, you know, when, when this was submitted to us, um, we were modeling, you know, basically CAD models, which were, which were driving the, the site submission. So that's what we're modeling, if that makes sense. Now, something did it change during that process? I don't know if if that's the case. I, I, you're you're referring to the trees, right? Yeah, the trees between retaining walls. So, just counting the number of retaining walls: one, two, three, four, five in our model, and maybe I think that's about what you ended up with. But yeah, so that's up here. Do we have a perspective from '64 that would have shown this? Yeah, it's not true. Let's assume we can't see anything. If you go to that aerial, looking down, and we can, you know, even in in hindsight, we could take an image of the existing, you know, of of the the that number nineteen, I think, or oh yeah, twenty two. One, two, three, four. So there's five walls there. Uh, so we could you know we could overlay the model as it was uh we could overlay the image and the model at the same vantage point and compare them can we put the uh, the photo put that image from 64 back up I guess for my, no. oh, go ahead. Yeah, do we have the actual? On the that right was hand, that 19? Right-hand side, be interesting to see the. Might be, it might be in your tabs. Yep. Another one that showed all five walls as built aerial. Kill the walls look. Sort of the shift in looking down at them to looking up at them, I think is, yeah. Well, I guess a, a philosophical question maybe for my, my fellow board members is, you know, so often as we're looking at 
projects and trying to understand their impact, we're considering the landscape. And frequently that landscape is outside of the applicant's control as, as is the case here. Um, is there anything that we should consider in terms of restricting what landscape can be shown in a, in a, uh, to only that that's proposed with the site plan or or otherwise to you know to avoid any future scenarios where uh, you know uh, we we evaluate something and its impact based on screening that may, may be part of the application. I mean, on the one hand, there are many projects probably that <laughs> you know don't have an impact because of the screening outside of their control. <laughs> And might not be as feasible if uh, if they had to be as completely screened, you know, within their own borders. And yet, um, certainly, this project has a has a much more dramatic visual impact on the corridor than I think certainly I anticipated. So, just for discussion. Yeah, I guess to me, there's like two. I kind of have two observations. Like one, um, one is just Bob is almost not a good example to use because he's so good at that. Mm -hmm. He is, yes. And these two images, the the rendering that that was produced versus the actual um photograph are so close in my opinion yeah no it is quite accurate um, in terms of physical evidence if the rendering that was submitted was the kind of like rudimentary crappy rendering that like i might do then it might <laughs> it it might not even be an issue it'd be like well you know it doesn't look like the rendering well, of course, it doesn't look like the rendering because the <laughs> rendering is like obviously, you know, an artist's impression of what what it might look like, and it seems like the the better the rendering, like the more accurate or more realistic the rendering gets, I think the more of a expectation there is that it's gonna that it's really going to look just like that when, and that kind of gets me to my second observation is that design or at least in terms of the building, maybe not, maybe not as much for site plans, but like, at least in terms of buildings, frequently, like, at least in my experience, like the design of the building itself at the stage where you're submitting for ARB um, consideration is still like very preliminary in terms of the overall design of the building. So there's still a lot to be ironed out. So there's this problem, and I don't know that I'm, I'm arguing for anything specific, but just observing that like a lot of times building, design will be submitted that looks further along in its development in terms of the design than it really is and it's like how much when you get approval from the ARB I guess there's a little bit of a just speaking not as a member of the ARB but as an architect and like how um, how much does that approval like lock you into what was submitted? Like how much can you take the kind of what you perceive as the intent of that approval to develop the design further to where you need it to go? Um, and how much does it have to retain the act appearance of like what you did? And sometimes that comes back to quality of of is submitted or at least like maybe not it's not even a quality issue but like you're able to get approval with some images that are kind of 
vague and maybe not show certain aspects of the bill. And that kind of gives you more latitude in terms of like future, you know, your ability to adapt. Um, whereas if you're very specific, at least, and I'm just talking about the three dimensional images that are produced. I mean, plans should be, my opinion, it's easier for like plans and elevations to be of weights. Yeah. Three dimensional imagery. It's like almost gives an advantage to somebody who's less specific about what they're showing and that. Um, depending on how how much they're held to that in terms of like what the final product looks like compared to what was submitted. Uh, so I don't quite know where I was going with all that, but <laughs> that's <laughs> I have my own random observation. Margaret, what recourse does the board have in the event that somebody submits a perspective like this, for example, where there's a clear disconnect between what happened in reality and what we were shown. Is there any recourse? Can you go back? Could you go back to Riverbend and say, hey, the walls, well, you know, this isn't what you submitted. Now you're going to need to plant in front of that. You know, we, we're going to need, like, do we have any power, authority? Well, it, it's a good question. Um, I think in this particular case, um, well, I guess the question would be um, go back to the approved documents. Is it just the plans and the elevations and the site plans, or is it also the, the 3D images that are approved? Um, I think we could ask some others about that. I'm just, I'm, I'm not sure what the answer is. I think in a case like this, um, particularly when it comes down to the retaining walls, um, there isn't a whole lot of opportunity to go back and um, plant trees like they're shown there. It's, you know, it's just not gonna work. Um, so there's um, limited opportunities for making up for it after the fact. Uh, we have looked at this all the all the landscaping that's on the approved plan has been planted i think they're all real small at this point i think you know give it a few years and it'll get closer to um what was shown maybe not exactly um, so there are trees at every level no you know, not on the, not on the retaining walls on the other side of the pond so between the pond and the interstate there are there are trees there um and i think those could can grow up and um will soften some of that well, but isn't that like i guess that's where i'm i think there's like a question of like sort of where do we you know what perspectives are we shown and what appears on them but i feel like there's a couple of things in this one that i'm noticing like i don't think it doesn't look like we got the view from the corridor that we were most concerned with in the package in the arb package right i didn't see a highway view that's the image, that's the rendering. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, um, well then, okay, so maybe we got the image, but we did get just a depiction of landscape that didn't end up getting planted in the original project, or the, in the eventual project, right? Like there's no trees at every level. There's not gonna be, it looks like there are plantings at that other retaining wall near that building in the middle. And that doesn't look like it got planted either. Um, and what's the date of that? Because there, what this is the approved site plan. Oh, I see. Yeah. So what we rendered, you know, I have to look back on the date, you know, because so, I think we're talking about process and cho choices along the way. And to your point there's a beginning of this and then there's resolution like testing the architecture and the materiality and there's a whole you know there's a 40 page document on cladding and windows and views and you know all that kind of stuff so i'd have to go back to see what 
where we were in process, but we didn't make this up. This was this is what we this is what we, this is a vector file drawing that. Uh, so I, I think you know you can see all this landscaping here. That I mean, you're just not uh, that it doesn't have an impact yet from the interstate. Someday it probably will. But there's a change at one point from a scheme where they had retaining walls that were further apart and planted to one where the planting all went onto the other side of the pond. I'd, I, we would have, I'd have to go back to the, like the preliminary plan and see if that one showed planting at each of the levels of the retaining wall. I'm not sure that it did. I mean, you can see, you see that lower retaining wall with that big swoop on the right-hand side? That's what's showing up, yeah, on the on the plan. And it's one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And there's even a little sixth one on the top. So there's parity between that and that. Yeah, it's just the landscaping that's not landscape. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Accurate. Well, and the spacing of the walls and the and the and the elevation of the walls. So if you look at the <clears throat> The rendering or the the picture, the photo from twenty nine. I mean, the the walls are enormous. Whereas you're led to believe in the in the rendered version that these walls are could be you know four feet, six feet maybe. I, I think what you might be. I don't know if you'd have to zoom in there because you might be looking at multiple layers of retaining wall that look like they're one, but they're they're actually tiered because they don't build them that high. So there's a foreground and a back. Yeah, there, there are, they are tiered, and you just, there's no, there's no, the, any, any planting that's there, um, is it, just not tall enough to, you're not to seeing it, so up. it's just, it's at this, you know, the photo is just making it look like it's a single wall. Back to the approved site plan, Margaret. So I think part of what it is, Frank, is I think we're seeing both the retaining walls for the building uh, and the retaining walls for the road. And yeah, but but in the rendering, they show plantings for the building retaining wall too that aren't on the site. Yeah, that's right. Like I guess I guess like I think that there's like this sort of really like <laughs> practical matter of just <laughs> there's a lot of landscaping that's shown in the rendering that does not appear to be reflected in the site plan. So either they they were never coordinated or something changed at one point. But um and you know it's to, pretty it's pretty significant. Uh, to, to be fair, there there is some planting around these walls um that's there. Um but they're showing like a whole the, series of place. trees behind that clubhouse or whatever, or the garage y thing that just you know in the rendering. <clears throat> yeah, the other, the other rendering, right? Talking about this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean it's a tough spot for you to be in as well, Bob, because if it's relatively, we modeled what we saw, what we were given. At yeah. That point, yeah. You know, so uh, outside of the existing trees that that those are that was a tough one uh but the other ones are just like a building or a wall it's just a, not to diminish a tree but we take a tree at scale and put it in where there's a circle so it's it's just uh it's not it's not subjective it's whatever the site plan tells us to do because we don't have time or the fee or if we're not the authority of that we're yeah. just populating it the way we, the way it's shown um so it's, yeah, so at some point the site plan must have shown a different configuration. And I guess for us too, it's just maybe next time we see an arrangement like this, you know that it's probably not possible to put trees on that retaining wall the way that they've shown, right? Right. It's like that would imply that the retaining walls are much further apart than yeah. what the reality is. Oh. You know, we, we you know, like that should have been self-evident, I guess. But the presumption was you wouldn't, you weren't really going to be able to see any of it anyway. <laughs> right. Which right. is really sure. Sure. 
Mm -hmm. comes back to your initial point. And I, th I think the other thing sometimes we rely on is tree buffer during the summer months. And then all of a sudden in the winter, it, <laughs> yeah. yeah, where did yeah. it go? <laughs> yeah. And construction. Yeah. Yeah. Takes a, uh, takes a toll. It takes a toll. Um, well, Bob, appreciate your presentation and obviously the care and the accuracy that you bring with the information that you have available to you. And uh, so, Thank you. Thank you for that. I don't do others want to have other questions or the lighter stuff's pretty cool. Seems like oh. you're doing good work on that. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's all evolving too. So that's the that's the other message here is technical question for you. If the state's now done LIDAR on the whole state, have have you has there been any progress in, in getting from LIDAR to CAD without does that seem AI like is going to do that? AI is going to do it, it, and they're working on it, but it's not really? there. The other bigger problem is using the data for site because it's not certified, and so this nobody will nobody accept it, even it. though it's yeah. more accurate. No one will accept it. You can't submit it in a uh, because there isn't a licensed surveyor that said, uh, you know, that that's it's more accurate. I think yeah. in the ground survey in a lot of ways. All right. Well, All thanks right. a lot. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. So we'll go on to our second work session, uh, which is the comp plan goals objectives. And um, Right. Yeah, if you're okay. ready. Yeah. Great. So um, we want to do a work session on the um, goals and objectives for the comp plan today. Um, you may recall um, both in March and June of this year, we had some um, discussions um, on the goals and objectives um, and overall process. Um, at your places, I've printed out uh, the comments that you had um, on those days. So you have those for reference. I also have it at the end of the uh, slideshow here if we need to display it for any reason. Um, so, um, and we have, we do still have Tori. Tori Canalopoulos is here um, with us today and she's on the team that's leading the comp plan update efforts. And um, we may ask her to, to pop in or she may have questions or comments for y'all as we go along. Um, what we wanna do is um, go through each of, each of the draft goals and objectives and ask you if um, they address all the um, comments and concerns that you've had or if you have ideas for um, additional comments to make at this point. Um, just as a reminder, the goal is the high level long-term direction. The objective is a more specific outcome or target to um, ac accomplish that goal. And um, after we have the um, get through the goals and objectives, actually we've already started work on the action steps. So the action steps are the, the more even more specific um, uh, points that would fall under each of the objectives. So we don't have those for you today goals and objectives first. We'll get to the action steps later. So I was just going to go through, read read the goal, give a highlight of the objectives, and get your comments. Will that work for you all? OK. First goal, Albemarle County will recognize, celebrate, and increase awareness of the broad range of historic, cultural, and scenic resources that contribute to Albemarle's unique sense of place. Um, we've got three objectives under this goal. The first one is, a, is about identifying, mapping, and documenting all those resources. The second objective is about sharing the stories and the information related to all those unique resources. And the third objective is about identifying and protecting against potential threats to the resources. I'm happy to take your comments. All right, I guess we'll just go right down the line. Uh, Dave, do you have any comments? No, I think they seem well aligned with the goal. Uh, Tara? Um, no, no, I don't have any comments. All right. Um, I don't think I have any comments either. It looks good. It 
sorry to disappoint, but <laughs> I don't have any comments either. <laughs> I, I, I thought it was, I think it's good. Okay, well, let, let's go through each one. If, if, if they're all speedy quick, then um, get Tori to come up and help us figure out what we need to do next. <laughs> <laughs> okay, goal two. Albemarle County will protect its historic, cultural, scenic, and rural resources and natural environment while considering the future trajectory of development in the community. Uh, again, we have three objectives under this goal. The first one is encourage greater preservation and protection of the resources um, uh, by the landowners and business owners through incentives, grant programs, and other funding streams. So that's about encouraging it through incentives. The second objective is increase the preservation and adaptive reuse of historic and cultural resources through county programs and updated regulations. And this would be um, uh, also in this objective is, is uh, information about um, energy efficient upgrades um, and also um, um, documenting resources um, before demolition. And the third objective would be cultivate and pursue strong partnerships to lend additional support to preservation, protection, and management of the resources. Sorry, would you mind flipping back to the last one for a second? I'm just trying to mentally. I'm sorry. Would you mind just flipping back to the last goal for a second, the last slide the, just for a second? The first one. I recognize. Okay. Okay, thanks. The first goal was about identifying and um, increasing awareness and the second one gets into protection. Okay. Comments? Could we just go, maybe could we go through all of them first and then jump sure. back? Goal three. Albemarle County will have opportunities for all community members to access and enjoy local historic, scenic, and cultural resources. Uh, three objectives here again. First one, provide both online and in-person opportunities to access the resources and to increase awareness about the benefits of pre preserving them. Objective two, protect, enhance, and recognize the importance of local view sheds and landscapes that contribute to the county's identity especially around historic and cultural sites and landscapes, mountain resources, and waterways. And objective three, reduce light pollution to protect and enhance the dark sky while balancing the need for a safe and built environment. Goal four, Albemarle County will have attractive and scenic entrance corridors and other important county roadways that support the county's natural environment and unique sense of place. First objective under goal four is to elevate the quality of design along designated entrance corridor streets and encourage the use of renewable energy sources and sustainable building materials. And objective two, increase the number of designated scenic roads in Elmore County. I guess I have a question about that last one. A designated scenic road, that's a different category than an entrance card or and does that come with specific um, requirements that are similar to EC requirements? Uh, well, a state scenic road doesn't have any requirements associated with it, um, but um, when we get to the action steps here, um, we may have some that talk about that um, state uh, designation that doesn't have the requirements and possibly getting into some of the um, discussion um, that you all have had previously about um, uh, the, the the impact of the landscape in the entrance quarters and is is it more about the just the scenic uh, the scenic aspect or is, is it the architecture as well and and maybe finding some action steps to to work through that yeah and the scenic designation would give us potentially a vehicle to influence landscape in a way beyond what's available through the MEC. Right. A, a potential action step could be to pursue a, a, a local um, scenic street designation, which could um, have regulations associated with it and address some of those issues. How many designated roads are there currently in the county? Scenic roads? Yeah, scenic roads. They're not that many. Um, 
And I don't have that list in front of me, but um, I can try and get that for you. It's 250 designated, but is it a state scenic road or, or it's a county? No, oh, you're quizzing me. I'm sorry. I did not study <laughs> well enough. <laughs> um, it's actually in, and I sh I, if I had just brought the um, the uh, current comp plan that you know, weighs 20 pounds, I could go right to the page and list them off for you. Um, I will get, I'll get that information for you soon. Under objective 4.1, I guess one question I have is how do we balance the elevate the, the sort of quality of design with potentially renewable energies used form of solar panels, for example, might compromise. The exactly. Pipeline. Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Um, I, we don't have the answer to that at this point, but um, I think our action steps will try to um, set a path for figuring that out. Um, can we go back to goal, I think, two, maybe? Oh, oh sorry. Do you have more, no, do you have yeah. more on four? No, no, I was going to say maybe we go three, two. Just, uh, I had a question on three, but we can go to two and then back to three. Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry to jump you in line. Um, <clears throat> I guess um, my one comment is just that the goal itself says, while considering the future tra trajectory of development in the community, but I don't know if any of the objectives speak specifically to how that development should happen or what our vision for it might be. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, I think that there's a way to say, you know, that, that, I don't know, that, that, that growth within the county, um, cause it, cause it won't look exactly like things that, precedents that we have within the county. But I think we still want to encourage a high level of design quality and consistency within those new development areas. I think just because we call it out in the goal, it might be good to include it in an objective. Okay. <laughs> I guess sort of related to that, I'd, I'd had the question looking at this one, because uh, on, on the one hand, there's the active verb that a county will protect its historic, um, et cetera, but uh, only consider its future trajectory. So I wasn't sure whether they're, it, whether the development of the county is addressed in an act with an active verb elsewhere in the goals outside of this section or. Yeah. I, I guess I'll turn over to change it to well developing. But 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 I'm not sure how intentional it was that the development is just being considered. Um, wait, I'm gonna ask Tori. Um, I think that wording got added in. Um, good afternoon, Tori Kenilopoulos. I'm a principal planner in community development, and thank you all for your discussion and input today. I think it's really helpful. Um, I think for this one, it was kind of meant to acknowledge that, you know, development is going to continue to happen, especially in the development areas. Um, and a lot of those more specific recommendations for how and where that should happen would be like in the land use section of the comp plan. Um, but in this section, just kind of considering what some of those chapter considerations are going to be related to historic, cultural, and scenic resources. Thank you. And also, I'll note um, the discussion on, on solar panels and the entrance corridors is something we've talked about, too. And I know we're not quite to action steps yet, but if you all have any thoughts on action steps or implementation, we're, we're happy to, to hear those and consider them. Um, and we've presented these goals and objectives to the planning commission and got their input. And I think they generally thought everything was going in the right direction. I think they had some questions about um, objective 4.1, um, kind of similar to that. What's the um, kind of entrance corridor piece versus the renewable energy 
and sustainable building materials piece. Um, and then we'll share these with the Board of Supervisors in January. So happy to come up and answer more questions too. So quick question on the objective 2.1 incurred greater preservation and protection of abnormal historic blah, blah. what what are the what are the things that you all are thinking we should be doing in the in the way of greater preservation that we're not doing now well we we don't have any incentive programs really at all in place so i i think the action steps will um will focus on on um, finding some of those incentive programs and finding some funding streams. Um, we haven't figured it all out yet. <laughs> so we're still, we're still working on that. Um, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the, it's really about the incentive programs. Um, there are some of these, we've been finding that some of these objectives overlap um, from, from one goal to the to the next. So there are other programs that could be put in place like um, um, uh, like the Historic Preservation Committee has um, recommended um, a program to um, acknowledge um, um, good preservation. So you could have an annual awards program that's you know, a type of incentive for a type of encouragement perhaps, but I think um, financial incentives are really um, um, what are needed. And just as a comment, like I, I do appreciate that what's being discussed is like um, incentives rather than like, you know, um, additional like, yeah, mandates or regulation that would like, you know, require additional reviews and um, all that kind of stuff, which uh, I think incentive is a better approach. It, assuming the incentives are incentivizing enough to actually get people to to tip the balance. Right. Well, under this goal, I mean, 2.1 is about incentives and 2.2 is about potential um, additional regulations. Uh, so I think, but, I think where we're headed is, you know, sort of a balance between them. The other, um, the other issue about um, funding is, you know, if if you have a local historic district with local regulations, then you can um, become a certified local government um, uh, through the um, Department of Historic Resources, and you can get um, become available for um, or eligible for um, grant programs um, through that organization, but. Um, you can't be a certified local government without a local historic preservation ordinance in place. Mariah has done the research that I did not do. She's got, uh, she's, see, there's five scenic highways listed in the current Compton. Um, just to list them off, they're the Skyline Drive, Blue Ridge Parkway, Colonial National Parkway, Journey Through Hallowed Ground Corridor, which is routes 20 and 53, and George Washington Memorial Highway. Well, any additional um, discussion or no? I appreciate the, uh, the development and the conference. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So we are working on action steps, Tori. We we do plan to bring those back in, in the future next year. Is that right? Yes. Um, we do plan to to share those next year. So I think the anticipated timeline would be rolling out action steps for all comp plan chapters. Um, probably in like mid spring, you know, April timeframe. So that would include kind of broad community engagement, but also coming back to you all and, and other county committees for input. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <clears throat>
Right, so we will move on other business. Uh, first is approval of the October 2nd, 2023 minutes. Uh, I'll move to approve this. Second. Thanks. I'm sorry. Um, I, actually, the minutes it's that we want to approve are November 6th. Sorry, I've got oh. two different dates there. My mistake. I'll move to approve this. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll still second them, I guess. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, I guess we'll put it to a vote. Okay. Mr. Henningsen? Aye. Mr. Hancock? It's not here. I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. Stoner? Aye. Mr. Mitsuno? Aye. And Mr. Vanderwerf? Aye. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot. All right. Um, are there any other items from staff or fellow board members? I guess following up on the presentation from Mr. Pineo, it, it sounded like Margaret, you might be asking County Council, uh, you know, what status those representations in the application or the presentation might have, and whether uh, that might give us any basis to ask for any mitigation in the in the visual. I will ask that question. Okay. Yes. Yeah, thank you. And I will go back and look at the preliminary plan again um, as well, so we can um, just see where things started to shift. Okay, thank you. Uh, the one other item I'll mention is, um, I think folks are aware that the county is reviewing its cell phone uh, uh, personal wireless facility uh, regulations um, based on the survey and um, uh, the study that's been done. There's a recommendation to significantly relax uh, the uh, and allow administrative approval of increases in height up to 30 feet above uh, trees, no limit on the extent of antennas. Um, I have an open question I, I just sent to Bill Fritz just to ask um, whether sites that were previously, well, entrance corridor sites that were you know, required ARB review to determine that there was appropriate screening, uh, whether those would under this ordinance be administratively approval for greater height and number of towers. So I think it might be worth, um, if that is the case in the current proposed legislation, or maybe um, meeting with planning and reviewing that. And I think there is going to be a planning commission meeting early next year. Um, I, I would appreciate if, if, if there is an impact to sites previously reviewed and, and approved by the board, well, uh, reviewed, um, I, I would um, like to request that we discuss it and perhaps formulate a, a board position. Okay. Thank you. I'll look into that and get back to you. All right, thanks. Yeah, that will be interesting to see how that whole um, cell tower uh, thing affects our um, input into that whole thing. Certainly there's about 30 years of, I guess, board and staff time invested in the current uh, regime, uh, which has preserved uh, a good part of the visual character of the county. So uh, I would just like to understand if there will be an impact to sites that we previously thought provided screening. Thanks. All right. Um, all right. So next ARB meeting is scheduled for December 4th, 2023. Um, are there any board members here who do not think they'd be out of a time bat? All right, I think it uh, sounds like tentatively we have four for that one. So uh, in that case, this meeting is adjourned to the next meeting on December 4th, 2023. And it is uh, 2.30. Thank you very Thanks much. Ten minutes to spare. Thank you.